Hi, I'm Rina Saboyama. I am a singer-songwriter, recording artist, producer, an actor. And I'm here with guitarist, singer-songwriter, legend, producer, Niall Rogers. And this is Vogue Visionaries. In this session, we'll be talking about our different journeys within the music industry, finding your voice as a musician, and advice on how you can turn your passion for music into a career. And we'll also be revealing some of the life lessons we've learned along the way. So Niall, when did you first pick up an instrument? When okay. dinosaurs walked the earth. <laughs> I was six years old. My first instrument was the flute. And what did playing the flute and picking up a musical instrument spark in you? I loved it right away. Um, going home to practice gave me a sense of I belong to something, right. which is strange. When and how did music become your career? I got my job at Sesame Street at around 18 to 18 and a half years old. And uh, that changed my life. Wow. Because Sesame Street led to my next job, which was being in the house band at the Apollo Theater in New York. This is a fabulous institution where you get to play with every artist that's hot at the time. So I went from Sesame Street to the Apollo Theater to forming my own band within a couple of years. And my first recording was a number one record. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> that is so cool. Rena, I mean, I think you're amazing. When did you first know that you wanted to be a musician? When I was like five, well, actually, maybe I was seven years old or something, I would sing this song, this Japanese song called Automatic by an artist called Utada Hikaru in front of the TV and I sang it to my parents and they were like, oh, I guess this is what she wants to do. I wanted to go to music school, but I'd given up every instrument, including the flute. I didn't have the grades to get into music school, you know, like the, the musical grades to get in. Um, so I studied real hard, got into Cambridge University, mm -hmm. studied politics there. But after going to Cambridge, I knew that music was what I needed to do. I didn't know how to produce, but I was, I was going on YouTube. So I learned the basics through there. It's been a very unconventional pop journey for me. So when you were younger, how did you find new artists and new musicians? You had to be in close proximity to the music that was being played. Right. So either you heard something on the radio or you were at someone's home who had a record player and they were playing some new stuff and you sit down, it was like a spiritual experience and you contemplate what you were hearing and, and we were all sort of cool and hip and we're like, yeah, man, you know, oh wow. Now uh, with the internet and especially uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. now you could just search. So you've collaborated with the most incredible artists, Bowie, Daft Punk, Madonna, What's been some of the most, like the standout memories that you've had? So I believe that almost every songwriter, every composer has the same formula or a very similar formula. We take a non-fictional event, right? Something that's a real life event and you focus on it. Like what happened with Diana Ross, we're working on this album. And one night I go into um, a queer club that was really popular. I go to the bathroom. On either side of me, there are at least four or five deep Diana Ross impersonators. Anyway, a light bulb went off and I thought to myself, I'm coming out. What if Diana Ross walks out on stage and goes, I'm coming out. <laughs> so good. With Bowie, I walk into this nightclub and the only person who looks like they don't belong is David Bowie, because he's now into the whole metrosexual look. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting completely by himself at the back of a bar, sipping on orange juice. Wow. And I walk in and I'm with Billy Idol and Billy goes, bloody hell, that's f David Bowie. <laughs> and as he said Bowie, he barfed, he went Bowie. No. Yeah, totally. Uh so by the time I get to David, um, he and I are completely engrossed in heavy conversation. I said, wow, man, you, 
you live and you work with my best friends. And he says, who? I says, you know, the young Americans. David and I, we didn't talk about any pop music at all. We only talked about jazz. Cool. And I found out David's knowledge and interest of jazz, especially avant-garde jazz, was incredible. He was so fascinated by my knowledge of jazz, and I was equally fascinated that he must have taken down my number, but I don't remember him ever doing that because he kept calling my house. So when David walked into my bedroom, he came in and he was playing a sort of folk song. Mm -hmm. And he says, nah, darling, I think this song is a hit. And he starts playing this thing that's very folky sounding. And I'm like going, Dave, I come from dance music. Please, let's make sure people hit the dance floor mm -hmm. when we come out with this song. So because I knew he was aware of the jazz vernacular, I said, hey, David, do you mind if I do an arrangement on this song? And he says, certainly. And I took the folk song and completely rewrote it. If you go on YouTube, you will hear that original thing that we did. No way. I swear to you. Oh, okay. I'm definitely watching I that. I swear to you. So you are on such a roll right now. I, like, I don't even know how to ask you this question, but who do you most want to work with? Artists and producers and writers who just know so much. I just want to just even just drink a tiny bit from their fountain. You know, I just want to know how they do it just learn mm. from their process. I mean, I grew up listening to, it was Pharrell and Timberland. That mm -hmm. was the only people right. that mattered, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. The Neptunes and Timberland. Um, so growing up, listening to Pharrell and seeing how his career progressed. I've already worked with someone who I admired and that's Elton. Right. Um, oh God, don't get me started. It's just <laughs> too crazy. <laughs> One of my all time idols is Lady Gaga mm -hmm. and I was able to do a remix on her her record and we met and it was it was fantastic i just i think she's wonderful so i'm really curious um how do you connect with your audience online and and how do you actually grow that audience last year during lockdown was when my album my first album came out and I would do these live streams on YouTube. Um, I got a gaming PC, rigged it, put a DSLR there, got a green screen, and did all the ticker tape and all that. Um, and that was, that was really fun, actually. And we'd do it around certain releases. It's such a great way to connect with an audience because it's, you're getting instant comments and instant requests. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you say hi to this person? And you can literally make someone's day or month just by shouting them out. And I love that. And I think that, you know, when you start doing shows and stuff, so many of it, so much of it is like, you can't really do a lot of free stuff, but to be able to do things for free on YouTube is awesome. I can't wait to work with you so you can show me all this. Oh my gosh. What's something that you wish, a tool that you wish was available to you when you were, when you were promoting music? If things were different, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be in the same place and I'd sort of spiritually be grounded the same way that I am. So I know that you produce a lot of your own music. How did you get started and what tools do you use? My passion for production is kind of like, I see myself as when I'm making an album, I feel like I'm the director of the movie. I'm in every single session, of, mm -hmm. whether it's writing or production, and I mix as well and with, with the mixing engineer. And even though I hate touching the mouse and I don't do it, I know what to say. Mm -hmm. I know what things mean, like gates and filters. Like I know what I want. And like, you know, I, I want less attack on that, that kick mm -hmm. or so much of it was YouTube. It was all free. Mm -hmm. All that thing was free. And there's so many channels that are dedicated to recreating certain songs on, mm -hmm. and they'll break it down on production. It's so useful. What advice would you give to new musicians who are trying to make it in the industry today? You know, I really feel that things started going well for me when I really just stopped looking at what other people were doing. I would say just what is it that makes you you? Really keep that close and then get technical and don't, don't get arrogant. In terms of growing your following, 
it's a daily practice that you have to dedicate the time to it. Just value the fans that listen to you from the beginning, talk to them um, and create, you know, create a world. I just want to say thank you for the second tour of the year. Thank you so much for your hard work. And cheers! I love you guys! Thank you! Keep me now! So Niall, you've had an insane career, written so many incredible hits and worked on so many amazing albums. What's your secret? Almost every artist I've ever worked with was a result of a chance meeting. And there's something that is just there. There's a vibe and you, you want to see what would happen if we vibe together. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, it's been that simple. D Daft Punk, let me give you a good example. So when Daft Punk released their first album, they had a song on it called The Funk. I go down to the listening party, don't know who the hell Daft Punk is. They pull me aside because they know me and they say that uh, we quietly dedicate this album to your partner, Bernard Edwards, who had just passed away only uh, a few years prior to that. You could feel the vibe. There's so much love between us and I never met them before that day. And we knew that we would work together. We didn't know that it would take so long. So when we finally worked together, that was the song that wound up becoming Get Lucky. Wow. And it was, check this out. So you talked about Pharrell earlier, mm -hmm. check this out. So now Pharrell goes over to Paris and just happens to go visit them. And they said to Pharrell, hey, what are you working on? He says, well, I'm working on this sort of Nile Rodgers kind of stuff. They look at each other, smile, and they said, really? Check this out. Wow, and so he did the top line. The way that I make chic records is that I play one guitar part, then I play another guitar part to accentuate the part of the groove that's the main groove, because right. I want it to be solid, and then I play another single line to go along with it. So if you listen and get lucky closely, you hear this thing going and that's we're up all night to get lucky yeah yeah but pharrell had to hear that in order to to write that so cool i love it that's do you still write charts of course wow so what's been the most valuable lesson that you've learned in your career? To not be a music snob. Any song, and I mean any song in the top 40, is a great composition because it speaks to the souls of a million strangers. As an artist, that was the greatest lesson I ever got. I wanted to speak to the souls of a million strangers. Now I want to speak to the souls of a billion strangers. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? There's nothing like a dance record to unite people and unite strangers. And that's something I'm definitely learning, I think. Dance music or music that makes people dance it doesn't have to necessarily be dance music. Right. Um, but pop records that can make, yeah, a million strangers dance or make a million strangers feel good. That is magic. It's... But there's a formula to it. There's a different formula for every track. And that's what's fascinating to me. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the same question. What's the most valuable lesson that you've learned? It's all about the music. That's, that's the big lesson. I know it sounds stupid. It's the music industry. It's, it's, it's what we do is music. But often you can get caught up, especially in pop, especially with pop girls, with the way you look. It's just about the music. Let's just write a good song first and let's see where that goes. We learn music because music is governed by mathematical principles and formulas that exist mm -hmm. and whenever we go outside those boundaries we just go a little bit outside those boundaries but in fact they can all be defined all of them so we're never original i we're never original. see that is such a good advice for young musicians it's about authenticity, not originality correct right let's just make great music yeah once i stopped trying to be original like Everything's so much easier. <laughs> <laughs>
Niall, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for speaking with me in this session. I've learned so much. I have to say the exact same thing about you. Um, all my life, I've been lucky enough to meet really interesting, fantastic people, and bam. Thank you. You just did it thank for me you. again. Thank oh, you. Oh, bless you. <laughs>